my first time in India. We've been here for eight days. It's been exciting. We have looked at lots of interesting issues. But most of all, thank you very much for the wonderful warm hospitality that you have shown all of us, but also the young people, the enthusiastic, passionate interest. You could really passion is everything, and in a sense, we can do a lot of wonderful things together in that. But of course, we also face major challenges. We all know that. This is the reality we're in, but it's the climate, the aridification of biosystems, the water security issues that we're all aware of, the soil degradation, and the need very rapidly in the next decade, 2020 to 2030, to really address some of these fundamental crises facing not just India, but humanity globally. And in a sense, we need to change. And we've really got to realize that we now, in this next years, have to institute fundamental change. Albert Einstein told us a long time ago, a hundred years ago, you cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. You need change. So we've got to look at these problems not as problems perhaps, but as imperatives. These are things we must do. But they are also opportunities. Because out of those changes, out of addressing that, out of the passion and innovation that we can bring together, we can make the change. And so the initial message is, yes we can. Yes, we can regenerate the Earth's soil carbon sponge, the healthy soils, the hydrology, the biofertility, the cooling of the climate, the nutritional integrity that governs our preventative health fundamentally. We can do that. The answer, we're standing on it. Not in this building, actually, because we're standing on concrete and tiles. But if we're standing in nature, we're standing on the solution, our soils. And it's regenerating the structure and the health of the soils that is really fundamental. We have all the solutions. Nature, as Didi has outlined, nature gives us the blueprints the templates, the demonstrations of what can be done because it's nature that used those templates, those blueprints, those processes to create the biosystem we're in. We wouldn't be here if there hadn't been a solution that turned rock, you know, just a dead, dry rock 420 million years ago into the terrestrial biosystems which we evolve we're on, which we depend on. So we have all those natural solutions. And all we have to do is learn to respect them, to listen to nature, to understand some of these key processes, and then how do we regenerate them. And this is a journey, this is the adventure that we're on. You know, regenerating healthy soils, zero budget natural farming is taking that wonderful opportunity to go po positively forward, saying, right, how did nature manage these biosystems, create these habitats, give us our health? What have we done that's perhaps deleterious? Quite some few things, but really, how do we learn to fix it, to regenerate it, to restore it, and to revitalize healthy communities. Yes, we can, we can do it. And in a sense, it starts again in nature or medicine with do no harm. Let us just simply do less damaging things and give nature a chance to help restore that. Okay, so all the technical solutions are there. The other thing that's needed, of course, is more us sociologically as humans. 
we have to have what we call agency. We have to be able to say, how do we affect the change? It's one thing writing scientific papers about theories and models, but really it's only when we put agency and practical solutions on the ground that actually change happens. And of course, there's several key parts of agency. The first is, again, our soils. Because humanity, we can't change the sun. Mm -mm. We can't change the atmosphere. I mean, we mess it up a bit with CO2 and what have you. But the atmosphere is the atmosphere. But what we do influence are our soils and our landscapes. So humans, through the last 10,000 years, but even before, have had a fundamental agency through our land management, through agriculture. So you in agriculture are actually in the driver's seat because what happens in agriculture either governs a degradation of the biosystems, the soil, or their regeneration. Okay, so soils are the key point of agency. We influence the future through our soils. President Roosevelt in the United States in the Dust Bowl, the picture that Didi showed us, he made the statement, it's absolutely true, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. There have been about 23 human civilizations. Over 20 of them we look for in the dust of archaeology. Dead because they've destroyed their soils and after three, four hundred years, civilizations collapse. But there's other civilizations that have learned to manage their soils, to regenerate their soils, to sustain their soils, and they have survived. Why? Because they practice zero budget natural farming. Right? <laughs> Not that simple, but the point is because they respected those natural principles of soil regeneration, sustainable soil cycles. So that agency of soil, we're in the driver's seat. But you here in Andhra Pradesh and India, in a sense, have another powerful, globally leading advantage or asset that you're part of. Because through your zero budget natural farming, local grassroots village groups, you have evolved the world's best, by far the best extension model. The capacity to make things happen on the ground for enthusiastic groups of farmers to get together, to problem solve, to communicate, to identify and test solutions and then implement solutions. I was amazed, I was impressed when you know, I give a YouTube talking about the rivers of water flowing across the world's deserts and basically saying, look, here is a science, here's a potential. But then it's here in Andhra Pradesh that really innovative leaders have sort of said, hey, let us try that potential and then we hear how many people in the space of two years have really started exploring that potential. So that point of agency that your groups, your extension model, your whole grassroots innovation model gives you is profoundly valuable. So you have that social agency. And out of social agency comes synergies. We go to school and we learn one and one is two. But nature didn't go to school, not that school. Nature works in symbioses, nature works with synergies, and in nature one and one can equal ten. Because you have positive multiplier contributing processes. And again, we can work with those synergies and build the productivity, build the resilience 
through these processes. Okay, so today, I mean, for the last eight days, we've had a wonderful exploration, discussion of some of these leading innovations. There's always more to know, there's no question, because life would be dull if we weren't exploring more questions. But we've had some really fascinating discussions, forensic, detective discussions. Here is reality, how did it happen? What are the processes that are driving it? And through those discussions, getting a better understanding. So these are fundamental innovations. And over the last eight days, we've talked about a whole set of areas where, in a sense, these are the frontiers that are relevant to you, to the future, to the world, where, in a sense, we are exploring, yes, how do we do things, how do we optimize things. Again, we don't necessarily have all the answers, but that doesn't matter. We are going on the journey. We are going on the adventure. And we will learn by doing and refining and perfecting and learning. So today, because we've only got, you know, a limited time, but don't worry, we can make time. Today I just wanted to go through each of those sorts of areas of innovation because it's these areas of innovation combined with your agency, you know, your zero budget natural farming, and so fee, the farmer field school model, it's through those points of agency that we can actually make the change, that we can turn these challenges into opportunities and viable healthy futures. So what I wanted to do is I just wanted to go through each of these fairly quickly. Paulie can sort of be a timekeeper or, you know, dictate, hey, 10 minutes on each. But what I want you to do is to say, well, what are the key questions? You know, what are the questions you've got, not just in detail, by all means detail, but also, hey, where does this take us? What is the opportunity? Where are the synergies that open up from each of these areas? And make a note of those questions, because your questions are important. We will then be able to sort of answer some of them when we have the Q&A after lunch, but we'll also be able to take your questions and we'll be able to sort of come back progressively with answers and information and fact sheets and discussions on them. Because the objective of this is to explore and then to document what is the evidence, what do we know, what don't we know, how do we progress it, what are the benefits, how do we take it forward. Okay, so that's really the start. And we start with hydrology because in a sense you know, we need air, water, food. We can live for basically, you know, three minutes without air. <laughs> we can live for about three days without water, three weeks without food. But really it is the water, the hydrology, that's really the basis of life. Okay, without that water we don't have life, but it's also the hydrological extremes with climate change, the desiccation of landscapes. Didi showed us the pictures. See, they're the things that are really going to crunch, really going to crunch the t next t decade in agriculture and society. So what is it that we need to do to understand hydrology and how we might be able to manage it better? And it starts very simply, okay, if we look at one, it starts very simply with a hundred raindrops. Okay, there's a raindrop. And really it's a question, yes, there's rain, there's 100 raindrops, but what happens to each of those raindrops? Okay, we were all very questioned, we look at these little tin cans that we've got, which we call rain gauges, we say, we have so many raindrops and somebody else has got more raindrops. And we record that in our meteorological data. But really the thing that matters is what happens to each of those raindrops. And at the moment, obviously 99% of those fall on soils. 
Okay? They fall on the land. I mean, there's some concrete and what have you, 99% on soils. But depending on the, how our soils are, and again, Beattie showed us the, di or the photographs, basically some of that runs off. And about 12 raindrops out of 100 end up in our streams and rivers. And about two raindrops out of 100 are able to be stored in our dams. And of course these figures will vary a little bit from country to country and region, but basically globally they're the same, you know, plus or minus, you know, 20% on each figure. Okay? And in a sense we rely on these two drops out of 100 for our irrigation water, our industrial water, our domestic water. It's pretty precarious, isn't it? We have a hundred raindrops and really we've made a system where, yes, we have dams and we have built 50,000 large dams since the Second World War, concrete civil engineering infrastructure. A lot of them are now silting up and a lot of them are not full, they're dry. I mean, even in America, you know, the, the very big Hoover Dam, they believe will never fill again because the whole aridification of the Colorado catchment which goes into it just won't get enough water. So silted dry dams aren't solutions. But of course this is only 14 drops so we have another 86 drops over here that were on our soils. What's happened to those? Well, the figures globally, or certainly in Australia, but again, it's much the same everywhere, some 36 of the 80 drops go up in transpiration. Now, that's basically good stuff. That's green growth. Okay? But some 50 drops evaporate or flood off. Now Didi again has led this thing and has showed us what happens when we got floods, the erosion damage of floods. But this is 50 drops which is 25 times what's in our dams. Uh, one of our colleagues this morning said, has said, yep, in India the figures are the same. The only thing is, well not the same, the thing is 70 drops out of 100 evaporate and some 20 drops are available for green growth and about 10 drops are available in the rivers and the dams. Okay, so I hadn't realised that. If anything, you're just as desperate as Australia. But it doesn't matter, it's not a matter how desperate we are, it's solutions because if we can do zero budget natural farming and we can have 365 days green then can we use a lot of those 50 raindrops back into transpiration, into longevity of green, 365 days green. Okay, so we've got a massive global water crisis this next decade but here you are you have a solution, 25 times increased supply of water and all we need to do is have wisdom and redesign through innovation to test that. Okay, so yes, we have challenges but we have marvellous opportunities and the benefits are profound because if we look at what happens with that water, and this is in a sense a hydrograph, engineers have these everywhere, and it simply looks at flow over time. Okay? And if we, for example, have a two-inch rainfall event, 
the question in time, I mean here we've looked at it in quantity, we're now just looking at what happens over time. What happens when we get a two inch rainfall event? Well, if we've got a degraded soil, just say we've got a soil here with 0.3% carbon, a concreted catchment, it's elementary, it's child's thing. What happens? We get a flood peak. Right. We know that, don't we? And of course we get a flood, and this is obviously the flood, and there goes Dee Dee's erosion. She's lost her road. She's got costs, in erosion costs. She's got massive costs in the civil engineering, all the concrete rebuilding, roadworks, billions and billions of dollars of cost. There's very, very great risk because obviously people die in these floods. It's very damaging. But more serious than all those costs, in a sense, we have automatically designed in drought. Okay? Because the water that we have lost in this flood peak is the water that would have avoided the drought. Because that's our hundred raindrops. It's gone down the creek, lost. So drought, it's not an act of God, it's an act of our land management. You see? And so basically, we are responsible. And if we are responsible, we can also become responsible by innovative land regeneration practices. Okay? And if we do that, we completely change the game, don't we? Because if we increase our soil carbon, just say, to 3%, let me give you, I might get a more dense color, because, oh, well, it's okay. If we change our soil carbon to 3%, no big problem, we'll get a completely different flood peak. Because instead of getting a flood peak, we'll end up with something like this. Okay? So sure, we'll still get some runoff. We might make this blue because it's, um, we want density of color, right? We will still get some runoff, okay? But not all this runoff. But now we have 365 days green. Okay? Because now we have water in our in-soil reservoirs. That can maintain that green landscape. Okay? And it's as simple as that. This is what nature had. It just created sponges. Organic soils able to infiltrate. Put that water instead of out the river put it into our in-soil reservoirs and really then sustain longevity of green growth. And we can do that too, just by regenerating the health of those soils. Okay? And so really it's that simple, but so essential. Because we won't be able to survive, you know, the next decade if we keep on degrading soils, losing that, aridification, drought, and then of course from that we get wildfires in Australia, California, the Mediterranean, Canada, Siberia, Alaska, you name it, it's burning, it's going back to desert. Okay? And that's the whole challenge. Okay, can we just change that by rebuilding soils, by rebuilding 365 days green, and in a sense completely turning what was a crisis into a solution. Okay, so very, very important. Now, people say, well, how do you do this? How do you increase from point three? And again, it's just as nature did. When 420 million years ago, 
there was no life on land, there was life in the oceans, it had evolved, it was now limited by nutrients, and so basically there was advantage in organisms colonizing the rocky land to solubilize nutrients. But of course, the rock was made up of a whole lot of mineral nutrients, you know, calcium and zinc and phosphorus, all in mineral forms. But of course, water and fungi and land, I mean, life couldn't get access to those nutrients because they were unavailable. There was no sponge. But as uh, life broke down that rock, solubilized or broke down that rock through, for example, the lichens again that Didi showed us, then that hard mineral rock changed because it broke that up and you ended up with what we call a mixture of just mineral detritus and of course it was mixed up with organic detritus. Okay, bits of organic matter in there as well. And so we had in a sense a spongy mixture of mineral and organic particles. But the physics, again, very simple. This is 2.6 to 3... Oh, 2.6 to 3.5 grams per cc. The bulk density, you know, that's the weight of those rocks per unit volume. And of course, a healthy soil has a bulk density of 1.1 to 1.3 grams per cc. So it's automatically telling us that 60% of this sponge, of this healthy sponge, was actually made of air. It was made of nothing. And just by adding nothing to rock, we create the sponge. But when we do that, we create all these voids. And this is, in a sense, Again, where all the water can be held in these voids. Okay? And so that was, in a sense, the thing that enabled this higher carbon soil to infiltrate, to retain, and make available more water. So the formation of the sponge is simply taking, yeah, mineral rock, compacted soil, compacted subsoils, adding carbon, very modest carbon, 3% carbon, creating sponges, adding nothing to the soil, and by adding nothing, creating enormous benefits because this soil now has, I better put it black because you can see it more, this has water, on, I'll get another black, this has water holding capacity. Okay. This soil now has also surfaces exposed. Whereas before, we'll come back to this in the biofertility discussion. Whereas before, nutrients weren't available. They were locked up in a rock matrix. Nothing could get at them. Now all these nutrients are exposed on these surfaces and of course the nutrient availability can increase, yeah, a hundred times. Okay? Now that we've got voids and spaces in the soil, the rootability, the capacity for roots to grow, to penetrate, to depth, to proliferate throughout that soil is again vastly increased. Instead of being limited to 20 centimeters on the surface, we have soils two, three, some soils 10 meters deep. Okay, so the volume of soil resources that are available have profoundly increased. So the nutrients that are available, the water that's available, vastly increased. Bioproductivity, vastly increased. Not because we've added anything, all we've added is nothing. Air. But we've changed the structure. And again, we go back to zero budget natural farming. 
zero budget, we don't have to add. You know, it's not about adding, adding, adding. It's about making things available. Water, nutrients, root thing, root capacity. There's another process here we'll just call microbial ecology. Okay, and as Didi again told us, it's the microbial activity in that soil. They're the actual engine room, the drivers of most of these processes, as they were for making the soil. But now we have the habitat, the substrate, the environment for very, very active microbial processes. Very complex, but there's 10 times more biomass, living, active biomass under our feet than above the ground. And all of that biomass, all that activity is driving nutrient cycles, soil development cycles, providing all those essential bases to underpin zero budget natural farming. Again, so we're just harnessing nature and we're using these natural processes to actually drive the productivity, the resilience of biosystems. Okay, so that's the hydrology. And then we ask the question, well, how do we apply that knowledge? We also have a bigger question because this is quite critical. We've been talking about a hundred raindrops, but with climate change, certainly in Australia, California, the Mediterranean, Rajasthan, even Andhra Pradesh, we risk, we risk with climate change that hundred going down to 70. So what would happen with decreased rainfall? What would happen if all we're thinking about is this system, this system here, instead of 100, we're down to 70? What would happen to your two drops in your dams? It'd be like the Hoover Dam in Nevada. Okay, never going to fill again. Okay, so that's the real danger, because unless we start thinking about this system, if we go down to 70 drops, we're in real crisis. Billions of people globally depend on this water. But let's be positive, because basically, have we got an alternative? We'll make that green, because green's you know, green. Have we got a question alternative? Can we make that into 120 drops? You know, this is blue sky stuff. Can we? Can we increase the water? And of course, this is exactly where we had an interaction because it's a simple physical fact. We have basically some 10,000 meters of air around the planet. Okay? And that air contains up to 50,000 parts per million, 5% of water as water vapor. So we have rivers of water flowing continually across the planet, deserts everywhere, in the air. And the question now, if we're thinking zero budget, natural farming, 365 days green, can we use that water? Can we harvest some of those rivers of water in the air? Science has really never contemplated that because all that data has been limited to what's in the rain gauge. But the rain gauges don't catch the rivers in the air. They're just, you know, humidity in the air. So can we do that? And of course you ask, go back to nature. You know, did nature harvest these rivers in the air? And the answer, of course they did. That's how cacti grow. They hygroscopically absorb water into the cacti. The sequoia forests on the west coast of California get 70 to 80 percent of their moisture from fog and mist harvesting you know, by their leaves. And so the question is, can we too design agroecosystems, cropping systems, 
where we too can basically harvest some of these rivers of water in the air. Can we rehydrate and regenerate deserts? Wacko. Can't do that. There's nothing in the rain gauge. But there's rivers in the air. Can we harvest some of that water? And of course we had a very, very innovative gentleman in Andhra Pradesh that said, stop thinking about it, let's try it. Okay? As you would. Wonderful. And of course that's called pre-monsoon dry seeding. So can I basically, can I put a, a seed on the soil with biostimulant because we want to create the best conditions for that seed and could we put that seed on that soil in May? In May, it's still very hot, dry, no water. And what happens when we do that? And of course, what we know is that, yes, we got some rain in July, late July, August, 40 millimetres, and we got some more rain in September, late September, 60 millimetres. But in a sense, these people did the experiment and they said, yes, we can get growth. But then the stunning thing is, what is it now, November? We went to have a look at it in November and we're standing in a multi-species cover crop that's two metres high. And um, again, I'm just estimating, but I, I do this all the time, hey, that must be 12 to 15 tonnes of biomass per hectare per annum. And it's germinated with no water. Now I know from science that a crop that's 10, 12 to 15 tonnes biomass, it takes about one litre of water biochemically photosynthesis to produce one gram of biomass. So that crop must have used in the order of 15,000 tonnes of water. Plus or minus, you know, like, I mean, it may be a super crop, but it doesn't matter, it can't escape physics, it can't escape biology. But we know that we've only had 100 millimetres of rainfall. So we know that even at this stage, it's only had 1,000 tonnes of water from the rain. So how did it get, you know, some 10,000, 12,000 tonnes of water that wasn't in the rain. See? And of course, this is the powerful stuff about zero budget natural farming. This is about trying it, innovating, and, and then say, this is reality. It's no, no hypothesis. It's not speculative. It's not somebody on a computer model. This is reality. You're standing in the field. And then you say, how does it happen? And of course, Because how does it happen? And of course then we come through and say, well, what would have happened? What would have needed for this seed to get enough water to germinate that seed, for that seed to put down the first radical, for that radical to have enough... Oh, it's okay. For that radical to create enough mycorrhizal fungi throughout the soil to absorb water and nutrients. And basically, what are the sequence of processes that must have happened? Now, we don't, can't prove every one of these. We haven't got all the measurements, but we know they must have happened. And of course, now the next step, zero budget natural farming, is yes we are going to look at and we're going to measure and we've been talking about how do we verify and measure and document the water budget in this system. But we're opening up very, very exciting new opportunities because the question is, you know, when, for example, that first bit of water, if we have organic matter, 
and it respires, it is broken down by microbes that are stimulated by the biostimulant around the seed. We know when we take organic matter and we respire it, it generates six gram for every gram of organic matter that's respired, it regenerates six grams of water. Because that's the reverse of photosynthesis. Remember? CO2 plus water, sunlight, make sugar, C6H12O6 plus 6O2, and we needed six molecules of that and six mo That's photosynthesis, our chemistry. And so when we go the other way and we break down this carbohydrate, the organic matter, we regenerate six grams of water. So was this biostimulant assisting those microbes to generate water? Was that water enough to allow that seed to imbibe, to put down a root? Was the biostimulant enough, again, helping these fungal mycorrhizae establish? So you had this extensive soil microbial root interface. And then the question then the question was, see here we have our soil particles. We've already drawn them over there. But basically what happens is that soil particles, even in soil that is below wilting point, still retain films of water around their soil particles that are held more tightly that can't be got at by plants alone. But our fungal hyphae, our mycorrhizal hyphae, which are growing intimately over all these soil surfaces, there can be 25,000 kilometers of fungal hyphae per meter cubed of healthy soils. Can these interfaces take up some of this water? Of course, yes, they can. We know that. Because they don't take them up through tensions as plants do. They take them up directly across their membranes. Okay, so have we got biochemical water here? Biochemically generated water? And now have we got access to unavailable soil water through these mycorrhizal fungi? Has that been enough water and obviously it must have been, to generate, hang on, I've got to get my pens right, look at this, I've only got four fingers, to generate that first shoot. Okay? Because that shoot could only have been generated if it got enough water. We know that. But now when we have a shoot, if we have that first shoot, can that shoot start harvesting water from the rivers in the air. Okay, can that now harvest dew and mist every night to start adding to that water budget? And again, we know that one to two millimeters of water able to be harvested from the air every night. When we work, walk through a young regenerating field, you know, walk through bare feet in the morning at 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, and you've got wet feet because this dew, this mist is harvested. Now, we're really more or less saying, look, here we are. We've got three sources of water that never appeared in the rain gauge and three sources of water that in sequence, as in nature, that enabled these pre-monsoon cover, rice-seeded cover crops to establish. And we know these are facts. I mean, you know, like it's not a hypothesis. We know the crop is there. We know that after, what is that, sort of 14 weeks, we're standing in two meters of healthy cover crops. We are standing in 365 green, we are standing in, you know, basically 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum rebuilding the soil carbon sponge. So these are 
profound because this is world leading. No one's ever done that. Nobody's ever talked about the rivers of water in the air. Nobody's actually put the trials in to say, hey, guess what? I've got 15 tons of audacity. It's not in the textbooks. Audacity. But there it is. Zero budget natural farming, 365 days green. Yes, we can do more verification work, but this is world leading stuff. And it's significant because if we can do that in Andhra Pradesh, we can re green deserts. We can regenerate arid areas. Rajasthan, 4,000 years ago, was a very productive savanna, supported a very sophisticated civilization. Can Rajasthan be green again? Okay, so hydrology, prime monsoon cropping. Paulie, are you keeping time? You've got to come through and say, stop talking and get on to the next topic, you see? Ten minutes each topic. Keep me in time. <laughs> but that's okay. Biofertility. We've already covered that, haven't we? Because in a sense, we've made that point. If we create the sponge, we now create the surface areas and availability of nutrients. And instead of being reliant on additions of nutrient, we're all talking about the availability, the surface area availability of nutrients. We've already talked about it here. We have 25,000 kilometers of, I mean, hang on, I should say up to, up to, not that everyone's going to get 25,000, but even if we have half of that, if we've got these hypo mycorrhizal interfaces solubilizing these volumes of soil, they're not getting just water, they're also taking up nutrients from these surfaces, okay, through their membranes. So we profoundly change the availability of nutrients for the growth of that plant. Okay, and so we have productivity as in nature without relying on fertilizer. I mean, who, who's been in a rainforest? Okay, who's seen trucks delivering fertilizer into the rainforest to make them productive? No one. You can't drive into the rainforest. It's too wet, it's too soft. Okay? And that rainforest functions not because the content of the nutrients, it functions because the massive availability and efficient cycling of those nutrients. The world's most bioproductive terrestrial ecosystem grows on some of the poorest mineral depleted soils on the planet. I did a lot of work in the 70s, 1970s, on sand dunes on Fraser Island, Kalula in Queensland, which is basically just crushed, crushed glass, parts per billion of nutrients. But we had rainforest because every molecule of phosphorus moved so rapidly in those forests, okay, that the productivity was governed by the availability, the cycling efficiency. We did P32 labeling studies. Within 20 minutes, we could get radioactive label in the top of the canopy when we put a leaf labeled with P32 on the ground. That means within 20 minutes, the fungi had broken down that leaf and taken nutrients from that leaf, put it back up for life into the cycle. So it's not the quantity of nutrients, it's the efficiency of their availability and cycling. And again, now we're talking about zero budget natural farm. We should put this in red or something bigger, shouldn't we? You see, we always come back to zero budget natural farming because, again, we don't need to add nutrients, fertilizer, if we have these efficient cycling mechanisms. And we had talk this morning, again, as the cover crops improved, as the successions, as the, you know, um, 
crop sequences, we had to use less and less and less, even by a stimulant, because the activity was naturally going more and more healthy and effective. Okay, so again, but, um, well, we can talk about it here. You see, we've got zero budget natural farming. Yes, hydrology. Zero budget natural farming. Yes, dry season. Zero. Okay, so it goes on, right? Here are solutions. This is, in a sense, what we can do. We haven't talked much about that nutritional integrity, but it's actually very, very profound. Okay, because you, me, every animal me needs about 33 essential nutrients for our biochemical health in the right forms, concentrations, ratios, and balances. Our whole biochemistry is run by enzymes, and those enzymes have these mineral essential requirements. Okay? If we don't have selenium, we don't have per perioxidases. If we ha don't have perioxidases, we can't kill cancer cells. The consequence, we end up with cancers that we can't control. Okay, so the nutritional integrity that we get the right nutrients from the soil is absolutely critical. And of course, in nature, that was never a worry. And before the Second World War, that was never a worry because we relied on these fungal filaments in the soils, absorbing nutrients from surfaces. And these guys actually operate completely different from roots because they selectively, intelligently solubilize and absorb these nutrients, but they absorb them in the right forms, concentration, ratios, and balances that they need. And actually these fungi, I should tell you this, these fungi are actually proto-animals. There's nothing closer to animals phylogy phylogenetically, which is family tree relationship, than these fungi, right? Way ahead of plants. They're really just our great, 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 great grandmothers, right? <laughs> okay, and so their biochemical nutritional requirements are exactly the same as ours. And they are selectively, intelligently taking them up through these 25,000 kilometers of soil, microbial, plant, membrane interfaces. It's like a quality control system. When we kill all those mycorrhizal fungi, as we do when we add biocides or fertilizers, the whole nutrition changes because now we're just reliant on taking the liquid water from the soil solution, and that contains, sure, it contains soluble nutrients, you know, your nitrates, your sulfates, your sodium, also toxic nutrients like aluminium and cadmium, but it doesn't contain all those cations, again, all the calcium, all the zinc, the magnesium, the manganese, the cobalt, etc., etc that are essential as part of our biochemical health. And what's happened since the Second World War, the nutritional integrity of our food, our industrial food, is now totally compromised. We've generally sort of got concentrations less than a third of pre-Second World War of the main nutrients, things like, you know, phosphorus, etc., etc., but often zero of some of these essential trace elements, micronutrients like selenium, which again may be critical for cancer control. So we have completely changed the integrity of our food, and at the same time, we have had this exponential increase, explosion, of diet-related diseases. You know, diabetes, cancers, cardiac diseases, autoimmune diseases, all related to the food we eat. We solve disease problems largely from external biological things, you know, bacteria and stuff through antibiotics, but we've now created a whole new industrial disease industry because of the food we're eating, because of the compromised nutritional integrity. And when you look at zero-budget natural farming, 
foods, see, we're always sort of saying, have I got the same yields? Have I got the same weight? Well, yes, mostly you have. Am I doing it with fewer inputs? Absolutely. But you don't ask the question yet, is this food of a higher nutritional integrity and health value? And if you ask that question and we get that data, and we will, we will, I'll put money on it. We are going to be working at 500%, five times the nutritional integrity of that food, and that will translate directly into the preventative health of the people that are eating it. We are now running globally a $20 trillion a year disease industry because of the compromised nutritional integrity of our industrial food. And no nation, no nation can sustain that disease. I, I was part of the Green Revolution in the 1970s, you know, as a researcher. We had one billion people hungry. We still have a one billion people hungry, not because we're not growing the food, because they can't afford to buy it. But we also have five billion people out of the 7.5 on the planet who are subclinically malnourished because of the compromised nutritional integrity. Okay, so again, zero budget natural farming. Yes, but Paulie will have to give me an extra five minutes time. Yes, okay, right. <laughs> Thank you, Paulie. <laughs> this is really, really fundamental. Okay, we better, because it's fundamental, we'll have to clean a bit of space. We'll clean a little bit of space. And we can give you all the fact sheets and all the data and stuff like that. So basically, we are looking at, here's a plant. Okay, and of course, this is our natural plan, and this is our industrial plan. And our natural plant, of course, has roots, and of course, so does our industrial plant have roots. Well, actually, has fewer roots because root shoot ratios change, right? But our natural plant has these mycorrhizal extensions. 98% of plants in nature have these mycorrhizal at 25,000 kilometers, right? But where the difference is, if we now microscopically zoom this up and look at that, we've got a mycorrhizal hyphae, right? So there's a hyphae, you know, this is exploded up. This is about 30 microns. A micron is a millionth of a meter, right? And these are membranes, phospholipid membranes on the outside. And they have little iron channels in it, so little doorways in their iron channels. And these membranes, as we've shown, where were we? We showed here, as they, they grow, uh, they grow over soil surfaces, right? So these high feet grow over soil surfaces. So we basically say, look, here is a membrane going over soil. And these hyphae will put organic acids and enzymes and actively dissolve nutrients from that surface. And then we'll take nutrients in and basically selectively, intelligently absorb nutrients. And we can do that because if we have essential nutrients like phosphorus, we may have 20 parts per million out here and they will concentrate that and have 200 parts per million inside. They will concentrate essentials. But if we've got toxic in in minerals, just say we've got aluminium or cadmium, okay, aluminium might be 300 out here, and of course the life doesn't, toxic to life, yes, it will exclude that and you might have 10 parts per million of aluminium on the inside. So we have basically this selective, intelligent membrane interface, 25,000 kilometers per cubic meter, 
quality control system interfacing between the toxic mineral chemical world of the, you know mineral soil and life and we can do this we can change put the same fungi in different environments and they will either switch on or switch off depending on their needs also what the outside environment is so again a selective intelligent quality control system and that's the thing that governed the nutritional integrity of what that fungus provided to the plant and of course the nutritional integrity of our food okay so that's how that system works this guy is completely different because what we've done we've killed all these mycorrhizal fungi haven't we we don't have them so here we have in a sense industrial hydroponics so we have just soil particles these ones so they're just soil particles and they've got calcium and magnesium and zinc and all the essential cations that we and plants need but they're all absorbed ionically onto the soil particles they're not in the soil solution right these these plants are really just only able to take up the soil solution water as if it was a straw so this is a passive passive water soil solution water uptake to transpire but there is no quality control system and of course what's in this water are all the soluble ions right so that's where your nitrate your sulfate and of course things like potassium sodium is but also if you've got acid soil that's where your aluminium and your cadmium is and so basically these plants are just taking this up as they were drinking a straw so you have no quality control you are just taking what's ever in the soup of that soil solution and so the nutritional integrity of the plant is completely different because of this difference in process okay Paulie you should hit the buzzer we've got to stop cooling climate <laughs> cooling climate okay so we've more or less sort of made the point um, that hydrology is pretty essential for life and in a sense hydrology is everything in agriculture but so it is in the climate because the climate's a very simple absolute inescapable reality we have an earth and we have sun okay there's our sun I mean the earth isn't as big as the sun I'm just a further away so I'm drawing it smaller <laughs> okay and we get 342 watts per square meter on average continually of incident solar ener energy coming into the top of the troposphere right which is the top of the atmosphere okay and to have a stable climate we need to have 342 watts per square meter going out okay and that's nature but nature's evolved something really much more sophisticated well because we've got this atmosphere we have a natural greenhouse which retains some of that heat but we've intensified that greenhouse we've made it a bit thicker and so now instead of 342 watts going out we only have 339 watts per square meter going out not a lot difference but still significant because we've got three watts per square meter being retained extra being retained and this is in a sense global warming okay and so that's the physics of global warming just the retention of that extra three watts by that enhanced greenhouse effect absolutely fact absolutely real but notice that this three watts is less than one percent of this whole solar energy flux so the task isn't to 
do hari kari or anything silly. It's just to do a 1% correction. Okay? 1% correction. And so then again, we step back and say nature. Well, how did nature regulate the 342 watts in and out? You know, we want a 1% correction. What have we done to nature? What do we need to do to restore that in nature? And again, it's then very, very simple. And it's, well, it's a bit more complex as stages and stuff, but let's just get to the essence of it. Okay, if we have a tree, it has a canopy, and of course it's got roots. And we know this tree is basically transpiring, isn't it? It's sort of putting water vapour up into the air. Because that's transpiration, that's green growth, that's this whole hydrological cycle. This is zero but I mean not yeah, zero budget natural farming three sixty five days. It's green, it's transpiring. So it's transpiring. But to actually turn liquid water into water vapor takes energy. It's called the latent heat of vaporization. So to do that we need five hundred and ninety calories of energy per gram of water to turn it from liquid to gas. It varies a little bit with temperature, you know, warmer water a little bit less, but it's still in the order of, you know, 580 or 500 and whatever. Okay, so there's the energy and therefore to get that heat, basically we have, to, or the removal of that heat automatically cools that landscape. Okay? Can't avoid it. And basically, across nature, the residual green on this planet is taking up 85 watts per square meter continually back up into the atmosphere. So this is a heat flux by the residual green on the planet, which is about 24% of the incident solar radiation coming in. So it's just logical to say, look, if we can increase this by some four to five percent, we would actually put an extra three watts per square meter back out to space. Okay, so increase that four percent and Didi, John Norman, 23% increase in ag Didi, oh, I can't see it. 23% increase in agricultural green transpiration would have equivalent effect, absolutely. It's also more scary though because we now on this planet have got half or less of the green vegetation that we did before agriculture. You know, we have basically cleared and burnt and degraded. We've created 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland on a planet with 14 billion hectares of land, ice-free ice -free land. That's 40%. We've turned to the desert. A lot of the rest we've degraded. Okay? So really, basically, we have fundamentally changed this heat flux. But even with what we've got as residual green, a 4% increase will offset global warming. We are in the business of 365 days green. At the moment, Andhra Pradesh, 25% green, 75% red. We can change that ratio. We've already demonstrated, you know, basically pre-monsoon cover cropping can change the ratio of green to red. We can extend the green, minimize the red, and automatically drive that process to cool the planet. But, but, to do that, we need water. And that water has to be in the sponge, doesn't it? Because unless we have these hydrological cycles recharging the sponge, we don't have the water to do the cooling. Okay? So again, um, it's elementary, simple physics. Okay, and yes, we can cool the planet. Yes, zero budget natural farming can cool the planet. But it goes further than that. Once this water's up in the air, 
it's sitting there as humidity and humid hazes. You know, these haze, very dominant now, humid hazes. And there's a lot of physics about those, but we won't go into that. We haven't got the time now. But also, we can take those humid hazes, that water vapor, and we can basically coalesce the haze droplets. Coalesce? I don't know if I've spelled that right. And we can make these things, which are called clouds. Okay? So if we take about a million haze micro droplets created here from the water vapor and coalesce them to a cloud droplet, we form clouds. And clouds are interesting because they have got very high albedo reflectance of heat directly back out to space. 50% of the planet at any time is covered with these clouds. They reflect 120 watts per square meter on average back to space. Okay, which is about third, uh, one third of the incident solar radiation. Okay, so a 2% increase in cloud cover will cool the planet. Okay? will do the three watts per square meter cooling required. Um, and this is, in a sense, if we're just using clouds, I mean, we've got a whole combination of options that we can use here, right? So basically, again, but the clouds, to do that, needs a sponge. Because if you haven't got the sponge, you haven't got water, you haven't got transpiration, you haven't got clouds. You've got a desert. It goes, okay, so that's it. Now, I mean, obviously this process, we, again, we won't talk about it now. It continues, and of course those clouds then will form raindrops. Again, the nucleation of those clouds to raindrops, and those raindrops, of course, will refill the sponge. Okay? And we can, again, talk about that detailed process. But what I'm saying here is a natural hydrological cycle, fundamental in basically keeping the planet cool. There's one other process that we want to talk about, very critical for this whole cooling system. And this is actually, again, really the basics of uh, zero-budget natural farming. If we've got a green landscape with vegetation, okay, and it's transpiring and therefore cooling, and it's protecting the soil surface, Didi's sort of point about, you know, plan cover, then very rarely does that temperature of that soil get above 20 degrees centigrade. And Didi showed us some of these temperature measurements, right? So it stays cool. But of course the same landscape, if we destroy the green and go to red, we have actually the same incident solar radiation but now the heat is being absorbed by the soil. Okay? And this landscape can go up to 70 degrees centigrade in Australia, right? We've measured that. 70, but even, I'm sure, in Rajasthan it's 60, and here might be 55 or whatever. I don't know what you've measured, but it doesn't matter. It's much, much hotter. Okay? And there's a simple... Again, inescapable reality of physics, like Einstein equals mc squared. It's called the Stefan-Boltzmann equation of black body radiators, which is what the Earth is, which says that the amount of re-radiation from the Earth's surface, the re-radiation is proportional to a constant times the fourth power of the temperature in degrees Kelvin. And of course, it's mathematics, but basically... This is the thing that matters, which means that the difference in radi radiation is related to temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature. Fourth power of temperature, right? And so what this is telling us is that this red country that's heating to 70 degrees is re-radiating massively more, massively more heat than these green areas. Okay, the greenhouse effect is actually driven by three variables. Okay, the first is 
the amount of re-radiation. The second variable is the amount of water vapour in the air because that represents 80% of the greenhouse gas absorption capacity. And the third factor is the amount of CO2 in the air which represents about 11% of the greenhouse gas absorption and about 9% is, oh, I'll show you, it should be four, is things like methane, etc. right? Okay? So this is what drives the greenhouse effect. But by far, the dominant driver and determinant of the greenhouse effect is the amount of re-radiation. We can effectively turn down the heat driving the greenhouse effect from high to simmer by keeping landscapes green. Okay? And then it doesn't matter how much water and how much CO2 is in the air. I mean, yeah, it matters a little bit. But basically we can cool climates and regions by simply 365 green, which is what zero budget natural farming tells us. Go, go, go. Good stuff. Okay, so the point is that, yeah, we can actually cool the planet by just avoiding this. Just very quickly, because Paulie's doing a good job telling me to hurry up. Very quickly, this re-radiation of heat also creates high-pressure heat domes over these red areas. So we end up with high-pressure heat domes over these continental areas. Low pressure moist air from the oceans or other green areas, by definition, physically, can't flow in and displace high pressure. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. It doesn't go the other way. So if we have a country, you know, we can, oh, we'll just do it here. No, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay, but if we have basically, take for example, here's this country, India, Ceylon, there's Rajasthan, here's Andhra Pradesh. And if we create high pressure heat domes over regions, then by definition, monsoon air flows can't flow into those. They luckily flow around them, but in some cases they don't even flow in at all. So the question now comes, yeah, what is the significance of this red country and creating these high pressure heat domes and in impeding the monsoon. India depends on the monsoon. Australia had a monsoon 6,000 years ago. We lost ours. Don't lose yours. Okay? Because that's everything. Because if we turn this country red, we will put a high pressure heat dome over India, as we did over Central Australia, and you will turn to desert. Not totally, because you've got the Himalayas, which will give you orographic uplift, so you'll probably have some. But it will profoundly change the monsoon. Okay, so again, climate change, cooling climates, zero budget natural farming. Now, we talk about shelter woods, uh, agroforests really, but look, they're part of this whole creating green landscapes, right? So it's integrating food forests, trees, smart trees, to maximize the capture of hydrology, you know, capture these things, to maximize deep roots to give you the nutritional integrity, to maximize the sponge. So we're just using trees integrated into agriculture, agroforestry, shelter woods to rebuild those natural savannas that are more resilient. So again, I think you understand enough about that so we don't have to go very detailed into that. Uh, Time-wise, are we, are we in lunch yet or we are? We, we got five minutes or? Oh, okay. Well, okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Because I did want to talk about urban agriculture, right? And remember I said in the beginning 
that Albert Einstein said you can't solve problems with the same thinking that created them. And it doesn't have to be that you have to do this in India, but in vast areas of the planet, the Earth, Africa, Australia, etc., we're getting to a stage where the amount of red compared to green is getting very dominant, but also the reliability of the rainfall is no longer there. For farmers to survive, they need to have predictability. They need to know, I'm putting a crop in, and I know that for the next 16 weeks, at least, I've got reliable rainfall. But if you've got no reliability, you are gambling. Okay, uh, we in Australia now, we, we grow a lot of grain, we export a lot of grain. We used to reliably get a crop four years out of five. We were gambling with the climate. Climate has gone much more variable. We now get a crop reliably two years out of five. It's not healthy because it's like Russian roulette with four chambers loaded. Okay? Not healthy because every year, every crop, we have to borrow another half a million dollars to speculate on the crop. And three years out of five failed crops that we pay interest on is death. Okay, and so basically we have to start thinking how do we change the way we grow food in the future. We've also got this story here about the nutritional integrity of our food. We have to get back to health, preventative health, so we've got to grow more nutritious food. We've also got the situation that there's 7.5 billion of us now there's 10 billion people projected by 2050, plus or minus, if we, if we get that far and without catastrophe. 80% of them will be in villages or cities, or certainly in concentrated urban you know, communities. And it's those concentrated urban communities that, of course, succinct for all the food we produce in agriculture, because it goes to people to eat. Sometimes it goes to animals to eat and industry to stuff, but still most of it is going to people to eat. And of course that nutrient is excreted by those people in those urban concentrations, right? They import the food, they eat it, and of course those nutrients are then excreted. And if we don't manage those e excrements well, we end up, as Didi showed us in Lake Champlain and Vermont, we get eutrophication, we get pollution. In the past, we used to get cholera and typhoid and all these things because we didn't manage our effluence. And so really, cities are gold mines for nutrients, but we're wasting them at the moment. So the question is, how do we design an urban agriculture that efficiently uses those nutrients safely and recycles them. And so we've been working quite a lot on yeah, urban agricultural concepts. Also, as the planet dries, we're going to have to have urban forests because, as we already said, with the cooling, those urban forests are very important. In Canberra, where I live, we can get a 12 degree centigrade cooling on a 40 degree summer's day where we have urban forests transpiring compared to the bare concrete regions three kilometers next door. 12 degrees. We don't need air conditioning in our houses because if we have a green forest, that's 12 degrees cooler, naturally. Okay, but, see again, trees and agriculture aren't always compatible because if you have trees and roots, these roots are often very, very, and we, especially with the mycorrhizal fungi, these tr roots are very, very competitive in taking up water and nutrients when we're trying to grow crop plants underneath trees. And that's why agriculture traditionally has had to clear the forest, 
chop down the trees, create bare soils to grow agriculture, but then you risk going into the red. So there's a bit of a problem. So what we've been designing is something that's really quite radical, right? But Einstein said you do have to change. So we've been designing a concept that we call wicking bags. And you probably have, there's nothing really radical about it or new, but, but I'll draw them in big. And it's simply a, a plastic bag, waste plastic reprocessed, about 70 centimetres cubed, right? And the bottom of the plastic bag, we have, in a sense, a, again, a plastic pillow, which we have some used drink bottles to support, and that can hold water, right? So this actually can fill up with water. Okay? And then we have a little tube going into that. And then we fill the soil on top of this wicking bag with a mixture of subsoil, clay, and compost. Okay, so we're really just creating a new soil above that wicking bag. We water that, of course, through the tube to keep that recharged. We have a mulch layer on the surface. And then we can grow vegetable seedlings through the mulch in these wicking bags. And the point is we can get a tenfold water use efficiency because we don't have evaporation anymore. We're not watering on the surface to support weed growth. We're watering from below so the roots have to go down you know, to get the water. We've got this water reservoir built in so we can now put grey water, you know, just waste household waste water, but it's watering from below so it's quite safe. But we only have to water once every three, four weeks because there's a water reservoir built into that system. Okay? So we have, a, in a sense, a closed system, but because it's a closed system, of course it's a plastic pillow, we can put that under trees. We can put that in courtyards. We can put that on balconies. We can put it on rooftops. And we can grow healthy, nutritious green food, tomatoes, spinach, potatoes, you know, corn, whatever. We can grow a lot of nutritious green food to address some of these nutritional integrity issues with a tenfold water use efficiency. But we can go much further than that because what we also do is we take a plastic bucket, you know, 50 cents, and we dig that plastic bucket into the soil and we cut open the lid. I mean, the base of it is cut open so that that lifts up. And this is all empty. And so then we put all our organic food scraps every day, every two days, into that plastic bucket. And of course, we have worms that are growing in this soil. And when they hear you, when they'll feel your footsteps because they understand the percussion, they'll come running up to have breakfast. And they'll eat all your scraps and, of course, take that back and excrete the worm casting, the biofertilizer, throughout your soil. So you not just have water use efficiency, but you've got an inbuilt, safe, nutrient, waste carbon, recycling process, a composting system. So you've got an integrated thing. Also, you don't have any mice or rats because that's in a you know, sealed plastic bucket. No blowflies, you know, no flies. It's all sealed in a bucket, right? Every morning you put your scraps there and you're really biofertilizing your system. So basically we're looking at these wicking bags to really be autonomous, autonomous urban food production systems. Okay? Because they, you can put them on wheels. You can put a string in and walk around behind, to drag them around if you want to take them for a walk. Okay? 
but they're not just autonomous. This is actually quite significant, and I don't know if I'm upsetting people here. This is sovereign soil. This is creating a new strata of sovereign soil. Because this soil, this wicking bag, belongs to whoever makes it. So all those landless people, all the children, all the women who can't afford land, they can afford a piece of plastics, we'll give them the plastic, they can get some degraded subsoil, they can get some compost, they can get some vegetable seeds, and they can feed themselves nutritious food. Over 50-60% of our food requirements can readily be met by these systems. Sure, we may need some grains from agriculture. Sure, we can supplement it with some protein. But basically, we can grow vast quantities of nutritious food to help sustain those 10 billion people. But more than that, we can create sovereign, independent, autonomous food systems. Okay? And for the projected 10 billion people, we, we, I'm sure you in India realize, 80% of the food that is eaten by people is grown largely by women in village agriculture under very difficult situations at the moment, carting water, often for kilometers, for hours, you know, really very, very difficult conditions. And in this way we can say, look, here are food production systems that can basically meet those nutritional needs, meet those food security needs, give independence. Now, I was really pleased when we heard that zero budget natural farming was talking about schools. Okay? And the answer is, yeah, look, we can give these wicking bag kits to every school. We can teach every child between the ages of five and ten, how to grow their own. They've got their own farm. Because all we have to do is give them seeds, which they pre-germinate in you know, little pallets, and then basically they're just planting the, seed, or the seedlings in there. They can get six, eight crops a year, continuously seeding, intercropping seedlings into these wicking bags. Okay, after about a year of growing into these wicking bags, you use the soil. What we then do, we grow a tree seedling in the soil. We have an advanced tree seedling that we can grow to two meters in the wicking bag. And then we can take that wicking bag with its tree seedling and transport it into the field and place it in the field to make our shelter woods. So then, instead of trying to grow trees in the field from little seedlings, we're just putting those in swales and alley crops into the field as advanced, you know, one, two meter high trees, resilient, tough, each with their own irrigation system. Of course, you'll slit the, you cut the side of the bag, so the, okay, so what happens there, you put these things into the field with an advanced tree, You'll cut the side, of, you know, make uh, slits in the side so basically the roots can grow out. You'll put a, a swale and a mound. Okay, there's the original soil circle. You mound that up around. The roots will grow out and into the soil. They'll always have their irrigation reserve. And so now you can create shelter wood, shelter build, agroforestry swales with advanced trees very rapidly. Okay, so... Again, this is really um, yeah, what we're looking at, urban agriculture, feeding 10 billion people. We make these plastic things out of waste plastic. This is just reprocessed waste plastic that we you know, collect, compost clean, reformat into these things, and basically make them available at a couple of dollars a bag as a kit. And of course, the idea is that every school, every child, yep, 
they can have their own autonomous independent gardens. You know, ten of these bags will feed a family. Okay, so that's the urban agriculture. So, uh, but in a sense, it's the same Z ZBNF principles, but now we've just put it into a micro package. How much? No, no, we, we've got a bag, 70 centimetres by 70... Oh, can they, be di they can be different sizes. We've got a small one, big one. But basically, we're sort of saying five square metres. Five square metres of these wicking bags would give you, what, 15 bags, which would be more than enough... To, well, depends on how much you grow, and, or, but more than enough to grow your spinach and your tomatoes and your... You know, most of the green vegetables which are the critical things for your nutritional integrity and health. Fresh green vegetables, right? Potatoes, sweet potatoes, there's a whole, I mean, it's endless. It depends on your season and stuff. But all that stuff that we're now trying to grow as crops in red country, right? And, and see, we sow seed in red country, wait for the rain. Can, I mean, this is non-irrigated. Wait for the rain, can we get it? But even then we've got weeds and we've got competition and we've got desiccation. And of course we control all of this. Uh, I didn't mention, of course, if we want to, we, we need to, we can put a canopy over that, just a plastic tent. And then even Didi and Vermont, when it's snowing, can keep you know, tomatoes growing. But you see, it's all... all good. And of course the same thing goes, I mean... If you've got healthy plants, they're fairly resistant as far as pests, but even if you want to stop birds eating your thing, you just put a little net across. It's all very, very simple stuff. Okay, go on, on, on. The last one I wanted to talk about, and we haven't talked much, but it fits in with all of this, is the question of ecological cycles. And it's really just bringing the whole thing to a conclusion. Because we said back here... See, nature, when you think of nature, what she had, all she had is sun, CO2, water, and stardust. The stardust made the nine planets, rock, and that's all nature had. Okay, and then 3.8 billion years ago, she invented, or no, she evolved life, these first microbial cells, where's our... Here, this stuff, right? She invented that first cell that was able to concentrate and exclude nutrients from the environment, create life. 3.8 billion years ago, 3.5 billion years ago, she evolved photosynthesis. The taking of CO2 plus water and sunlight to make sugars. And that was a profound change. Blue-green algae in the oceans making sugars. And all this biomass, all that sugar, is actually stored solar energy, which is what we get back when we eat it or burn it, stored CO2, which we put back up in the atmosphere, and stored water, which we, we can recover in biochemical water to grow things. And so this is really the cycling that we're talking about. If we can increase the amount of green growth, 365 green, then we're actually storing solar energy, carbon and water and we can cycle that more efficiently. What we've talked about with the nutrient dynamics, we can also basically now cycle nutrients more efficiently. So zero budget natural farming has abundant resources of energy, water, nutrients by harnessing these cycles. Okay? And so we don't need to add. We don't, nature doesn't mine fertilizers, doesn't have trucks transporting fertilizers around. It just cycles things more efficiently. And the whole basis then for zero budget natural farming is to again use these ecological cycles. Um, there's lots more technologies and innovations we can talk about where, for example, here, urban wastes and effluents, how do we actually get nutrients from those back onto the land? There's a very valid um, understanding that if we're 
harvesting nutrients from a soil continually, we definitely need to bring those nutrients back. There's no such thing as free nutrients or new nutrients. They're finite. And so there's a valid point. Yes, in agriculture, if we're taking nutrients away in food, we have to bring those nutrients back from the cities. And there's, again, cycles that we can do that integrated with zero budget natural farming to do that. But as long as we're conscious of these cycles, the answer is yes, we can. So look, in wrapping up, but we'll have all the questions, in wrapping up, the big message is um, we have to change. We have to redesign new agricultural systems. And the answer is if we look at all these processes, yes, we can. It's elegant, it's efficient, natural, and safe. It's extremely profitable. It's total practical, totally practical. Okay, we can do it. We need to obviously keep on looking at the processes. There's always more to learn, but that's the adventure. It's exciting. That's excellent. But we've also got enormous leading advantages, and particularly here in Andhra Pradesh, through what you've done through your zero budget natural farming, because your agency, you know, the, the young people, the farmer groups, innovating, driving these things is profoundly valuable. Nowhere else on the planet, to my knowledge, have you got anything like that extension, grassroots, empowerment, enthusiasm. So look, I must applaud you. You should applaud yourself. That This is really critical. These challenges are real. These opportunities are real. Your capabilities are real. And this can be a basis for globally a fundamental means to meet water, food, habitat security for the future. Unless we have that sponge in the soil, we don't have the water. And all these cooling process and all the 365 day green depends on water in the soil. So as we started, it is water in our soils that is a critical thing. That's what we control. That's what we as humans influence through our land management. And so it's all about rebuilding the Earth's soil carbon sponge. And we've basically saw the situation. All we have to do, can we go from 0.3% carbon to 3% carbon in our soil to rebuild that? And it's actually quite, quite simple but critically important that we do this. So people ask, how do we do it? And we basically say it's as simple as A, B, and C. And again, it simply involves a plant. And it is really what nature did. Because nature, again, had just sunshine, CO2, water, nitrogen in the air, and stardust or mineral elements, rock. And that's all that nature had to build the biosystem. And we are using exactly the same processes. And so nature basically had A, which is agriculture, and agriculture is all about that, CO2 plus water plus sunlight making sugar. And of course oxygen is a waste product. So this is a process of photosynthesis and it drives of course all of the life on the planet. Because that's the, where we get the sugars from that drive basically biological life. And so A is all about agriculture, to build the soil carbon sponge, to rebuild our healthy landscapes. It's all about agriculture. And it's about maximizing the production of sugar. And of course, that's what we do in agriculture. And we've been doing that 
for 10,000 years. You know, how do we maximize plant growth to produce food? And we should keep on doing that. It's essential. The problem is, to do that, we've been using a lot of inputs. The whole process has been based on, have we got inputs of fertilizer, irrigation, biocides, do we burn a lot of forest? Do we cultivate a lot of forest? Do we bear fallow a lot of land? And so we've been trying to grow agriculture or maximize A, but we've been using a lot of high input processes to do that. And in a sense, under zero budget natural farming, we're trying to limit some of these inputs. But we'll come into that in a second. So the point is maximizing A, agriculture. But really what is more important is not the biomass we grow, and it's not how much we grow, but what happens to every molecule, every gram of biomass that we do grow. It's a bit like the water. It's not whether we've got 100 drops, it's what happens to that biomass. And all through nature, all through history, there are only two things that can happen to that biomass, that sugar that is produced. Two things, only two things. It can either burn back to CO2, okay, it can go back into the air burning as CO2 or s oxidize slowly to CO2 or else it can be turned into stable soil carbon. Okay, so this is stable soil carbon. Okay, so it can either go up into the sky again, or it can get fixed in soils. And we control which of these processes B and C happen. We control the balance of oxidation or soil carbon by a sequestration. And we control that through our agricultural practices. If we burn most of A, you know, if we allow, or we have practices where most of A gets burnt, then as we, we've taken away, then obviously we're progressively losing that carbon in the soil, we're collapsing the soil structure, we're degrading the soil, so we actually degrade, we dry the soil because it can't hold water, and that turns into desert. Okay, so excessive oxidation burning will desertify landscapes. You see that happened in Australia about 6,000 years ago. Lots of burning, burning, burning. And then progressively the soil carbon lost and it went drier, more burning, and progressively to desert. But if we can turn, not all of it, but if we can turn a fair percentage, you know, 50, 60% of that A into carbon, stable soil carbon, then we are building the sponge. Then we are rebuilding that soil carbon sponge. And basically, there are natural processes that do that. Before that, we say, look, 40% of the carbon is living above the, or is above the ground in the shoots above the ground. There's another 30% of the carbon in the roots and then another 30% of the carbon is emitted by the roots as exudates. Sugars and amino acids that are leaking from the roots to support all this microbial ecology. You know, all the microbes, the fungi and what have you. And it is the fungi that turn this 30% plus this 30% into humus, and it is other fungi that turn 
or will the fungi grow through the soil? These are the 25,000 kilometers of fungi growing through the soil. And when they finish growing, they leave behind their cell walls. They're made out of chitin, glucosamine, and that produces another compound called glomalin. But these are really the constituents of stable soil carbon. They're driven largely by soil fungi. And of course, in zero budget natural farming, the biostimulants that you're adding in the natural, in the zero budget natural farming are, in a sense, stimulating these fungi to make more carbon in the soil. Okay, so it's simply a ratio of B to C. I mean, not that B is bad, because we need some CO2 to keep A going, because this depended on CO2. But if all of it goes up to CO2, we've got deg degradation. At the moment, our industrial agricultural system is very, very oxidative, right? Because everything we do, whether we're clearing forests, cultivating, over-fertilizing, irrigation, biocides, bare fallowing, all of it is driving oxidation, burning effectively. And at the moment, we're putting five to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum back up as CO2. So we are losing, across industrial agriculture, five to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum back up as CO2. And of course, that's why CO2 has gone up abnormally from the 280 parts per million to now 416 parts per million in the atmosphere. Okay, so we've been doing that excessively. Effectively, we're taking about 120% of A because we're more or less oxidizing most of what we grow plus we're oxidizing some of the legacy or heritage or former carbon that was naturally stored in the soil, but we're releasing it. And that's, in a sense, driving desertification. So that's totally unsustainable. That's unsustainable. But if we basically get this balance right, then there's no troubles. We can, in our good, innovative farmers, easily put... 10 tons of carbon per hectare back into the soil per annum, okay? So we are actually storing 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum back into the soil, rebuilding the sponge. And that's just logical accounting because in agriculture, as we said, we were looking at that mixed dry season crop, and if we said that was 12 to 15 tons, of biomass per hectare per annum, you can understand, I mean, that was biomass, so carbon's a bit different, but if that's above ground with a below ground, all this is very consistent in terms of numbers. Okay, so we grow plants, we limit the amount of oxidation, and if we can do that, more of that carbon is turned into stable soil carbon, if we can biostimulate these fungi, more of that carbon is turned into stable soil carbon, and we are progressively building the sponge. But there's one other fundamental process which is, again, extremely valuable and beneficial. Obviously, we've got an empty space here, and nature doesn't have any empty spaces, so we've got another function which we'll call D and we'll call that dividend. And this is really where nature has really got some very, very powerful, positive feedback processes. Because for every gram of C, every gram of C that we put into the soil, every gram of carbon we put into the soil, that soil can hold up to eight grams of water. Okay, and that's simply the water holding capacity in the organic matter. That's not the water holding capacity in the voids. You know, so it can be way above eight grams, but even the organic matter is able to hold eight grams of water. 
So you can see by increasing the soil carbon, we massively increase the water holding capacity of the soil. And we saw that on the hygrograph. For every gram of carbon we put into the soil, again, we looked at that previous, we massively increase the surface area of mineral particles and the nutrients available, so we increase the biofertility. Okay, and again, for every gram of carbon we put in the soil, we increase the structure, the oxygen, and the capacity for roots to grow down to depth and proliferate, and so we greatly increase the volume of soil through which life can proliferate, and therefore the resources of water and nutrients that are available. Okay, so that's the rootability. For every gram of carbon we put in the soil, we similarly massively increase the actual microbial ecology, all these nutrient uptake processes, all this water uptake. So we're really increasing the biological microbial life. And of course, we've already talked about that, that basically it's the microbial life the 10 times of the biomass in the soil that drives the fixation, solubilization, access, uptake of nutrients and the cycling of nutrients. And it really governs through these combined processes the productivity and resilience of those soils. So we have a whole sequence of positive feedback multiplier processes the synergies we talked about in the, minute, the beginning, 1 and 1 equals 10, generated by the soil carbon. Okay, so this is in a sense the carbon dynamics in soil, but also how soil carbon is formed from A, minimizing B, maximizing C, and then you can't avoid it. Automatically you get dividends D. And of course, nature takes it further than that. Because by having D, by having these positive feedback synergies, it can stimulate the productivity of A without any additions whatsoever. So zero budget natural farming, productivity is driven by D without any inputs as in nature. Okay, so the whole natural productivity of agriculture, if we drive it by D, we have productivity, we have resilience, and we don't have any need for these oxidative inputs. We don't need the fertilizer. We don't need the biocide. We don't need the irrigation. You see, because We've been adding all of these to try and stimulate A from industrial inputs. But if we're doing it through D, we don't need that. So in a sense, that is the basis of this synergy of zero budget natural farming. We can take it one step further because we're humans, so we can have E, which is the economic dividends or economic returns. Because if we have D going to A, yeah, we can easily have 100% yield. We can have less than 20% of inputs. Okay? And inputs and return on investment is the fact we have resilience. We can now get reliable crops back again four years out of five, not two years out of five. Okay, so we have resilience. And this is going to be really important as climate change extremes and variably increases. We have buffering, okay? Because of D, we can buffer extremes. Okay, because of the sponge, we can buffer extremes. We also massively increase the natural capital 
which is in a sense the soil health values and the equity values in that soil, right? If we've got a hectare of healthy, productive, resilient, high carbon soil, it's going to be worth 10 times both natural capital you know, values and equity, cash values compared to degraded red soil. So we are massively increasing the capital value in cash, but also in ecological services, ecosystem services, its capacity you know, to be resilient, to supply water, etc., etc. And of course, we also massively increase then the social capital, the viability of the communities and the farmers that are farming that soil. Okay, so really what we're coming to is that through this ABC processes, we also end up with, in a sense, the revitalization of rural economies because of these natural de-dividends. And in a sense, that's the opportunity, yes, to revitalize agriculture, but also to revitalize the stability and feed the 10 billion people projected. So hopefully, you know, that gives some explanation of how, the simple practical ABC of how, but also the benefits of how.